Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Langrak Tuzo. I'm the director of ARIS, the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism, and I'd like to welcome you to our Gaia Then and Now, the Mythopoetics of Climate Change series. For those who may be new to ARIS, we are an archive of symbolic imagery as it appears in diverse cultures and eras throughout human history. ARIS offers a unique perspective on the collective and individual psyche as it expresses itself through image, story, and myth that point to underlying archetypal themes. It is this unique perspective that ARIS wants to bring to the discussion of climate change and our human relationship to the earth. In this series, we have explored Gaia in both ancient and modern realms. Today, we will be in the modern realm and perhaps even into the future with artist George Berugi. But before we get to George, I would like to encourage you all to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll have a couple of minutes at the end of the program to take some questions. And now to give you a little background on today's presenter. George Berugi has been exploring our relationship to the environment in the context of the climate crisis for over two decades. He has been especially focused on human climate migration and our interaction with and perception of wildlife. George has exhibited widely nationally and internationally. He has had solo shows at PPOW Gallery, the Baker Museum in Naples, Florida, and the Newhouse Center for Contemporary Art, amongst others. Originally pursuing a degree in marine biology, he graduated from the University of Miami with a BFA in painting. For over 10 years, he has been a member of the Fine Arts faculty at the School of Visual Arts, where he earned his MFA. He teaches drawing, painting, anatomy, comparative animal anatomy, and bio art. George is a recipient of the NYFA grant in painting, a fellowship at the Smack Mellon Residency. He has created work for the Wildlife Conservation Society, the New York City Parks Department, the Audubon Mural Project, the La Brea Tar Pits, and for over a decade illustrated the Birdwatch column for The Guardian UK. Welcome, George. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, everything Allison said is true. <laughs> that's that's sort of the story. And um, so I'm going to be giving you guys this, this sort of talk, which I had said to Allison too, was really a pleasure to do because it made me take a look at my work and the arc of the work and where I've been at with it for, you know, honestly, like 20 years or so. Um, and actually even more. So I'm going to show you some older stuff just to kind of give a little bit more context. But yeah, I've been thinking about more or less climate change in the context of my work forever, but the images associated with that and how we how we can try to visualize it. So this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, like Allison said, I went to the University of Miami for marine biology. So that's just to give you like a little bit of a, a context thing. So there's always been this art and science kind of back and forth in the work. And you know, which I think kind of makes sense. You know, they lump arts and sciences together in school. And the way I always talk about it with my students is, you know, you're using a methodology to investigate something that you're interested in using the scientific process. If you're a scientist and as an artist, you kind of make up whatever your practice is going to be, but it is still this kind of exercise in investigation. Um, so I went to college, ended up taking none of the required classes because you can sign up for whatever you want when you're in college. And they just kept taking art courses. So then I officially switched over to the art department. And the department there was really dominated by, at this point, still kind of the philosophies of Clement Greenberg. He was like the main guy who was the proponent of abstract expressionism. So in this program, most people were working non-representationally. So it was like a very kind of like abstract driven program. But I was making images like this because I liked pictures. You know, I was very, very drawn to images um, and wanted to make images. And as much as I appreciated non-representational work and still do a lot, um, the image was very meaningful to me. It was the way I kind of could move through the world it was like making images of things helped me understand them. And I always have been making a lot of images of animals. Like on some level, I think I just never outgrew that thing that kids do and they draw animals. It's like a little kid. One of the first things they draw is going to be like a bunny or something, you know, and I kind of just never outgrew that. And it was a way for me to 
really kind of understand, you know, the world around us and how we interacted with the world around us. I grew up in New Jersey and there's a really interesting interface between wildlife and human development there because it is the most densely populated state here. And so you always see everything. You see like a constant manipulation of the environment, but you also see a lot of wildlife there because it does happen to be a really like wildlife rich place, even though there's so much human manipulation. And I was just really interested in how, you know, the natural world shapes us as Americans and then how we see it and the way we use images of the natural world to sometimes mean nothing having to do with the animal and sometimes something that might be rooted in it or might not. Um, and it was, this is something that kind of really, really got me hooked for a long time. And I'd spent a lot of time driving around the country. I think I drove cross country. I was trying to count this up this morning. It was either six or seven times in the span of four years. And I just was taking these meandering trips and really kind of trying to understand how we were seeing nature and what was there and truly like what what is the American relationship to the natural world and how we manipulate it and how we build things and how we see it, present it and conceptualize it um, and then conceptualize ourselves within that. Um, and how we really reacted with wildlife and the natural world, I found really endlessly kind of interesting because I feel like Americans had this still this attitude of, it was almost this appreciation for our nature and pride in it, but a still desire to have dominion over it and, and control it. Um, and there's something that this thought that came into my mind at the time of the dominant cultures in the U S were cultures that weren't rooted in the land here and weren't rooted in this actual physical place. And so we were starting to, in a way, like create, there's like an American folklore, an American way of looking at things. And I feel like we always had this very specific lens where it was either kind of either Discovery Channel or in, in my case, Mutual of Omaha, which I grew up watching all the time, or um, a Disney type of lens. Like there was something that was a lens on wildlife that wasn't quite on wildlife's terms or on nature's terms. It was still, there was an, a very present American editor in that. And so I feel like we, there was this disconnect I was feeling where we were not seeing things for what they were. It was always with like a very particular point of view, um, really shaping how we were looking at stuff. And so I really, you know, I was investigating this sort of you know, attitude or disconnect for a while and, you know, trying to present, making these paintings kind of illustrating, and they are pretty illustrative on this level, this, this weird disoriented feeling. And so it's showing sort of, you know, these animals in their like kind of disnified, cutified way, but living the lives that they would live and, you know, doing the things that they would do and having all of the really intense experiences they would have, like, you know, giving birth or, you know, dying or mating, all of it. Um, so I, I did get to a point too, though, that then it was like this idea of a culture that's rooted somewhere. I went back to, I needed, I felt like I needed to get back to the root of something and really get back down to the actualities of it all. And to look at animals and look at the natural world for what it actually is. And to really reckon with it, like to, to really be one-on-one -on -one and have this idea of trying to connect, which, you know, on some level, I feel like was the root of, there's the root of so many things that we'll talk about later in regards to climate change, just this disconnection from the natural world and taking these things that were used as symbols, but trying to prevent them, present them as real individuals or something in their own actuality. And I did that with people too, like, you know, how, like conversely, how do we see ourselves as animals and taking someone who was a symbol, almost more an icon rather than like a living, a living animal and presenting him again as like a living, breathing animal. And I was really interested in that idea of like how we can see ourselves truly too, um, as animals that are in an environment and how we fit into that environment 
and how that environment shapes our our culture and the the weird things we do in the environment. This was based on those outfits that people wear when they're raising hooping cranes and so that they don't imprint upon humans. But I sort of had this idea of like what what sort of rituals could almost develop out of that if like the hooping cranes were gone, but then we carry this like relic memory of them moving forward. Um, and every time I was presenting people, I, I was trying to present them as animals fitting into a certain habitat and trying to remove all signifiers from them so that it was hard to tell what time they were, were maybe from or what class they would be from and really trying to just only give you the clues of the actual environment. Like if these people are hunting loons, that means they must actually be in like a clean environment, not something that's totally degraded. So it's not like a post-apocalyptic thing. So all of this idea of us changing the environment does not have to be sad necessarily. Um, there can be hope in there. Uh, an image like this, in addition to thinking about, you know, how we're part of nature, you know, how we've, how we've changed it a lot. So this sort of very minimalist representation of Florida with introduced trees that we might associate with Florida and native trees, introduced birds, native birds, the kind of re reducing it down to, to something very, very simple, but saying kind of a lot of what was going on in there. And I've also been interested in what we actually build into the landscape, like the structures that we create and the form that they that they take and how those things that we build interact with nature um, and sometimes provide not necessarily always habitat, sometimes very much habitat, but how they there is still an interaction there with something that's like very fake that we would make, how it still is operable and still exists in the natural world. Because <laughs> we're constantly marking that natural world and we're marking things in very bizarre ways. And I never actually saw this, but this is something that I feel like totally could imagine this happening. And there's something so degrading about it, but at the same time, there is this almost a yearn for connection. And so to mark something like a beached whale, it is almost this looking for the connection by making our mark. And I, I am fascinated by that with when people make marks and how those marks can convert into symbols of something. And there can be a lot more going on in there. Um, and things that you would witness in the natural world, how that can then take on sort of an icon type of shape and a landscape that's been marked with layers and layers of people, you know, marking it. Like I'm interested in that impulse. Um, one person will mark something, then another and another and another, and it's a built up history and language and communication. And it can really look ugly in the landscape, but at the same time, when you like start decoding it, there's something there. Um, even on here, you can see like on the upper left is sort of a simple representation of those two elephant seals like smashing into each other, but in a more like almost graphic, simplified, starting to become a hieroglyphic type of way. Um, you can see it in this one too, actually up at the top again, right there, that red one to the left of that sort of octopusy type of <laughs> type of thing there on this on this piece. Um, and the different type of iconography that might develop as like our planet's changing too, and how we could have taken different paths at different times and our path now, how that we don't really know what the path is going to be and what sort of imagery will develop out of that. Um, all the sort of things I have painted in here in this area that was sort of an imagined, um, you know, uh, Lake Mead type of situation where like the water is going down and, you know, people having to build some sort of habitation in different places and what then they'll they'll write on the, the walls there, like these sort of icons and symbols that become important to them. I've also been interested in how some iconography echoes back and forth between time and how that might, something might have a new relevance or might be adapted into something else way into the future. So almost this like vegas I don't know, water tower type thing in the shape of Aten. And all of the rituals that are going to develop too and what will happen in these places. Like on here, there's the Zuni heartline motif on this pronghorn, which was maybe sacrificed. Who knows? Something's going on there. And because we're continually altering 
the earth in, in large and small scale. And what that looks like can be really disorienting. Um, like this sort of earthwork size thing on the side of this mountain could be an art piece or something with like religious significance or who knows where it looks like lava dripping out of something but it also could literally just be something from an extraction industry some sort of large industrial scale thing and it's hard to tell because sometimes when you look at the the landscape it just becomes very disorienting like what we've done to it or not um and how that mountain was shaped that could it could remind people of a volcano maybe it wasn't really a volcano but it was shaped that way and becomes an important spot for people to go and kind of do smaller rituals or ad hoc type of artworks there everything we build really does take a shape from something and you know there is this idea of like you know what we're making and how it reflects the natural world and this building i had been thinking about this this really tall tower nabemba tower in brazzaville in the congo and to me it looks sort of like a tree and then that to me was reminding me of the history of the congo and king leopold's ownership over the Congo and the brutality that happened there which got me thinking about brutalist architecture and so I kind of imagined that tower being reimagined as kind of a rubber tree with the gutters as almost like the rubber taps and the building sort of being brutally cut off at the top which was a practice in that horrible, horrible time period there where people were getting their hands chopped off and a lot of brutality. And so it was sort of reflected right into the architecture, even though in kind of a subtle way. Um, one that's not that subtle is a sort of my idea of a memorial for manifest destiny, where the idea of memorial, which usually has a very solemn attitude, I was curious about what if what if we built a memorial that showed the violence and fleshy horribleness of war and of conquest and of everything that happened in the American West, but presenting it almost in those like Albert Bierstadt landscapes that are this romanticized, um, you know, go forth into the West and, you know, really, you know, dominate and it's ours for the taking, like almost this glorious sunset, um, but a clearly man-made type of object but with your, you know, pronghorn still in the sage in front of it and kind of presented very much like that sort of iconography that we, you know, we've become used to. Same idea, something like this, a memorial for a glacier. Um, what will we build in the place where a glacier maybe had been? It's, you know, all of this change and tumult that's coming, there's going to be really interesting imagery that comes out of it. Um, I've been trying to understand that with with all the animals as well. And this piece is titled Hurricane Andrew. And the day I moved to Miami was the day Hurricane Andrew hit. And the day after, I was walking through the campus, which was really raised. And uh, I found a dead owl, which was seemed so symbolic of something, like starting my education. And there's a dead owl. I don't know. And it got me thinking about all those kind of smaller, different dramas unfolding. There was all the drama unfolding with the people. But there's so many dramas unfolding with animals there too. And I, I had this idea of these, you know, deer in the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew in, in a flooded area. And I initially had a fawn nursing on her. And then that was too, too on the nose somehow. And so I had switched it to this adult male nursing on her. And then that reminded me of the end of Grapes of Wrath when Rosa Sharon was nursing the old man. And I didn't realize at the time, but that was an allusion to Roman charity, which was a... a uh, sort of a theme that was um, explored with, you know, artists in Greek and Roman times where, you know, it, a, a young woman nursed her father and sometimes mother or, you know, older relative like in a jail to keep them alive when they were sort of banished. Anyway, it was an interesting thing where there's these images that echo forward. Sometimes you don't even know you're hitting on them, but something's happening there. Um, but I made her sort of indifferent to the whole thing and trying to change that. And everything that's in that image is it's pretty reduced it's all these things where you're like, is it natural or man-made? And as you investigate in the natural world of working its ways upon man-made objects, sometimes it's hard to tell like what's man-made, what's natural. Um, and the more and closer you inspect, it doesn't necessarily come any clearer. And all the even tinier dramas, this gives you an idea of uh, some of the detail on these. Oh, I should say also, by the way, 
these things, everything you've been seeing so far has been ink on paper and the scale varies, but something like this is about like nine and a half feet wide or something. So it's like a big old piece of paper. So I really gained, got interested again too in, in this idea of like going back to the root, simplifying things and you know presenting animals that mean so much to us and trying to bring them back onto like some sort of a footing and, and, and represent them in a way, almost as these iconic, you know, like new icons or something. And something like a bluebird, which we represent in the same way all the time on the same calendar that you're going to get from Audubon every year. Like it's, there's, there's a certain expected way to see something like this. But when you go back and investigate that animal and really think about it and how it might live and present it human scale, like this would be the size of a person in the painting. So then that makes you look at it differently. You could take something like a bunny, a black-tailed jackrabbit, and if you paint it nine and a half feet wide and show it in this way that you're not used to seeing it, it, it might make you think of it differently when you're going back to it and you're showing the, the ticks on the ears and showing this animal for what it really is with a high level of detail. And there, there's a few reasons why I make these so detailed. One is to try to slow the viewer down so that honestly, even if they're just looking at this and the first question is like, how long did that take? They're then looking at the image longer and that makes them think longer. And that makes them maybe think about the image again so that they are really kind of internalizing it and trying to connect with it. And it removes them from the idea of bunny, like this is a bunny or a bear. And looking into that and reckoning with it again and inspecting the details and you know, seeing what's suggested by that. Um, something like a ram, which has a lot of significance in a lot of different cultures, but trying to, again, almost give it that power back. Like how you would, how would you feel if you first saw a ram? How would you feel if you first saw a blue jay? Like we're used to seeing blue jays. I'm in the Northeast and, you know, it's a really common bird for everyone to see. And, but blue is not that common in nature. It's very rare in nature, in the natural world, the actual natural world. So this bird that's blue, what would that mean to you? And again, like painting it nine feet wide with, you know, a sort of obsessive level of detail on it, it, it can really make you slow down with it. And making this level of detail is also, it's a level of respect. Like it's, it's me understanding the animal and understanding how to present it, but respecting it by putting in all that detail. And the more you observe the natural world, the more you observe odd things and things that are presented in a different way, something that's like a little bit different than maybe how you would expect it. And that can become sort of, sort of an icon, or you can take something that's presented in a certain way and literally turn it on its side. And then how does that feel? Like witnessing a meadowlark with this incredibly bold marking, like how would that, how would that feel? Would that all of a sudden mean something different? Would that like, would that spur you to mark the landscape in a different way and interact with these animals in a different way. Um, and making these a certain scale, again, it's like to give the power back to, to these animals and to have you reckon with them again in a way that's a little bit less expected and a little bit more jarring. Um, like if you came upon a melanistic black deer or white-tailed deer, would that mean something? Like we're, we're familiar with the idea of like the white buffalo or something like that. But if you all of a sudden came across something off the norm in nature, would that all of a sudden signify something? Would, that, would you mark that? Would you look for another, you know, some, some other symbol? Would you then in turn mark some of the wildlife around you? Um, like an elk totally doused in pollen would have like a different power. And also trying to internalize the power of these animals, like a a lynx in all its true weirdness is there's something to behold and it's parallels back and forth to us. Um, this is a picture just to show, you know, the scale of what these look like, just so you can kind of see like how that idea again of uh, making physical artwork with the intent that someone is standing in front of this artwork reacting to it. Same thing here, just how would you feel? How would you react in front of this artwork? How would it feel? Um, something like the California condor, uh, seeing it for what it is and how that could symbolize a lot. Um, 
an animal that deals with death, a condor, a vulture, something like that, that means different things in different times. And as we've separated ourselves from, from death, we've put them into this category of, of gross or ugly, but here's an animal that takes physical bodies. It deals with the dead and maybe takes them up to the heavens. And a California condor traditionally would have maybe feasted on a beached whale or have it on and connecting in a way the heavens to the underworld. And how does that creature feel? And, but again, not shying away from, you know, the, all its poop streaming down the skin of that whale, because that's how they thermoregulate and, you know, kind of not shying away from all the details, but finding like a different truth in those details. Like this bird doesn't think if, doesn't care if you think it's ugly, you know, it's, it is what it is. And us having a look at it makes us think more about it. And also a bird that we've kept in this space between life and death, because every con California condor is accounted for because it was a species that almost went extinct and we rounded them all up, but we actively keep them alive now. Um, a passenger pigeon, something we did not actively keep alive. We ate them all. Um, representing these extinct animals too. There's a, a, a power to that. And in a way, again, this respect, like the heath hen, which went extinct on the East Coast and bringing that in a way, trying to like bring that back to life and turn it into something. Uh, Carolina parakeet. These are all bird species that a lot of artists have, have represented because they're kind of like famous examples of extinction. But I think there's a reason why it's getting really well tread right now. And I think it's because of this almost anticipatory grief of what we are going to lose because the world is changing so much. And this traveling back and forth in time that I've done with the work, trying to go back when these things were alive and forward to when they might not be or hopefully will be again is something that I've, I've I've played with and an image like this and so I think a lot about like you know American history and this to me was an imagined scene of what a European could have seen when they landed on the shores of Florida these raccoons eating the eggs right out of a green sea turtle and these I you know at the time of the Columbian exchange when after 1492 in a way all the continents were reunited again and we have species coming from the old world to the new world and diseases and pathogens and different things all foods going back and forth um this piece is titled annunciation you like <laughs> i was raised very catholic and you can, you'll never be able to remove me from that i guess but a pregnant a horse with like a rainbow here and in a way this was my idea about the reintroduction of the horse into into north america because horses existed in North America and then went extinct towards the end of the last ice age. And then were readopted by a lot of indigenous tribes and peoples here. And there could be this ancestral memory of the horse, who knows, like it, it could be there. And it, it, because it gained such significance in a lot of different peoples who were here. And I don't know, there's something interesting to think about that, that, that back and forth there. Um, corn, how that went everywhere and thinking about like the power of that and the people who invented corn basically. And going back to some of that, the title of this piece is Xochipilli, which is the Nahuatl word for the God who is the God of plants and music and creativity. And also depending on like what you're reading, the patron, patron of homosexuals and male prostitutes and hallucinogenic plants. And I was almost sort of presenting this, these two new world things the, in a way, almost the male and female, like the, a very genital looking corn and this, this red winged blackbird flipped upside down, the whole thing almost becoming like an abstracted mask. Um, and sort of looking for like presenting these animals, a lot of times you'll, you'll see I'm presenting these animals in a very like graphic way, like very geometric and graphic way to kind of trigger something else too. Um, and so in all of this, sort of thinking about the Columbia Exchange and where we were and where we're going. I, I made a lot of work about Florida specifically. And there's a swallowtail kite actually kind of in the composition of the Florida flag, <laughs> which is the Confederate flag more or less. And in this sort of X shape and showing, you know, what is in Florida. And I, I kind of went through this, I, this time period of really trying to show what was in Florida, but presenting these things in a monumental way as these, as these new monuments, but again, being truthful to what they are. And this piece was originally presented this way, which to me was, um, 
a representation of the perspective and the hard lines that are cut through Florida. Florida is like this weird uh, state of contrast where you have a ton of nature, but you have a ton of manipulation and a lot of straight lines cut through it, whether it's roads or canals. So I was thinking about this as sort of a perspectival view of a canal where you're seeing the reflection of up, up, and, up and below looking down the canal and all the wildness that still exists there. Um, like anhingas, like slipping under the surface of this and gators and all the stuff that's there. And there's so much wildness there and a mashup of these animals that we don't necessarily think of being with each other, but are with each other there. Um, blackbirds and flamingos and pine trees and just the constant struggle though that I feel there and it's this back and forth and this bear sort of presented almost as like Kali the destroyer um, and this one's sort of like Saturn devouring his children this Florida panther and it's this this interesting idea too of Florida still having a lot of this wildness as we're actively trying to destroy it and it also being this spark point like the first place on the mainland where Europeans made landfall. So it's this like spark moment of like ultimate globalization. And it's also the first place we'll lose in North America to sea level rise, which is as a result of all of this globalization and industrialization and speeding up. And so it's it's an interesting, an interesting sort of thing to think about and a place to, to reckon with. And I, all the imagery I was making of this was the kind of constant struggle with your, you know, uh, queen conch being devoured by two horse conchs. And we associate like the queen conch with like paradise. Like it's going to be on a logo of a resort, but you know, it's this very weird animal. And then it's being devoured by these also native mollusks in Florida. Um, something like this with a native and an introduced species, a hooping crane, which like they can get re <laughs> trying to reestablish in Florida, but it being eaten by a Burmese python which are doing great in Florida. So it's all this sort of beauty and beauty and destruction at the same time, like the beautiful roseate spoonbills, but in this contorted, you know, composition, Florida Panther destroying these flamingos, which, you know, we associate flamingos with Florida, but they aren't really native, but it turns out that they actually maybe were way back in the day, like in the fossil record, they're there and there's this back and forth and something like the Florida Panther, which has been on the brink of existence there coming back, but there's no reason why it couldn't completely destroy a whole flock of, you know, flamingos. Um, but then maybe feel regret or something. And I've gone back to the Florida Panther a few times. It's almost become like some, some avatar such an obvious one because it's like the charismatic you know megafauna of florida but it's trying to capture in its catness or something there's there's something in there it's almost like an avatar um and it's finding my way through like almost processing the feelings of this too i wanted to present this florida panther almost again this is like a very probably nine or ten feet wide piece um almost like sekhmet the egyptian lion-headed goddess like protector gatekeeper something fertility but power and potential for destruction um examining all this stuff in florida it was like i was looking for looking for guidance almost it's like a, a shift of focus was starting to happen i think too um this piece also was like the technic technically the hardest piece i ever made because working brush and ink on paper i don't know how many people are art people in this talk but brush and ink on paper you can't make any mistakes and painting this, I had to paint each side, each side and replicate it in reverse each time. It was definitely technically the hardest thing I ever did. Um, but sort of looking for like a shift of focus and like almost a creation and origin of a new world within the nature of Florida, like going back again to the root, like in a way trying to build a new culture in the natural world that's here. And almost looking for the divine with within these animals or within the way I could present them. Like again, almost like a mask type shape, like looking for a new God in there. Um, this piece is titled Huracan, just an adapted Arawak word, which then became hurricane. 
And the folklore in Florida is that the ibis is the last bird to leave before a hurricane and the first one to come back. And Huracan the, was the name of the god of chaos and all the wind and kind of all of this. And so it's, there's sort of, in a way, I'm like looking for that god there. Um, and the imagery that's like coming out of climate change right now is kind of caught up to us. And when all those wildfires were happening in Australia in 2019, I remember being really struck by them because it was this imagery of of movies in a way of like what we've been talking about with with climate change and destruction and fire and brimstone and like just these totally disorienting images. And I was I, I was at this point and am at this point now where I spent a lot of time in the in the space of requiem of let's see what is here let's let's acknowledge it let's memorialize it and I feel like I'm, in a way almost to process my own my own climate anxiety and climate grief I had to start picturing like a new world and where we will go in a new world like how what will we build. And how are we going to like find our way through? So I felt like I was imagining, I've been imagining where we're going and what we're going to build moving forward and what the iconography of that will be. And in these huge changes, there's going to be new religions, new ways of thinking, new ways of finding our way through. So I kind of went back to that and tried to really put myself in the mindset of someone in the future and what rituals will be performed. And I went back to clay, literally clay, almost like muskrat diving down and coming up with the bit of earth under the nails to build a new earth and started trying to imagine like, what are we going to, what are we going to have? What is going to be here? Um, like you can make the argument that a lot of, a lot of religions and cultures that have a great flood in their history, you could, you could trace that back probably to an oral tradition of all of, of the end of the last ice age when there was crazy amount of flooding people have always lived along coasts because of abundant food sources those would have gotten really flooded there was a lot of inland flooding when glacial dams broke that tradition those could have been passed on for millennia it's totally possible so i think within where we're moving there's going to be new stuff that's going to be coming up um and how are we going to see the new world we're in where are we going to look for signs to point the way how to navigate our way through and what kind of rituals what rituals will we invent what animals will take on new or different importance um it, it's interesting like by performing these actions by like sculpting these things it, it's in a way i'm trying to wayfind through this and i've been seeing the animals that are in these pieces that I've still been putting in almost as like the witness, like animal as witness to, to what's going on um, in these disorienting landscapes, especially migratory birds. That's been a big one because I've been thinking for a very long time, uh, you know, about migration paths of people and birds and both are migrating to survive. Birds migrate for survival. They're after different food sources and nesting sites and all that. that. That migration is a necessity of survival. Human climate migration is going to be a necessity of survival. People are already migrating due to climate change. That is already happening. It's going to keep happening. Um, and there's certain routes that mirror each other, whether it's up through Central America, across the Mediterranean, there are certain routes that people and birds take the same route. Birds have the ability of flight. They can cross borders. They can also be on borderlands, like borderland species. What are they witnessing? Are they there? What's going to be the significance of them? Um, I can imagine them taking on a spiritual significance in a way, these migratory birds, like be like the bird, be like the bird to, to navigate through this, through this world. Um, I've intentionally made these landscapes really disorienting because... Uh, I think we are entering, we're going to be entering into a disoriented landscape. We already are disoriented in where we are now when we have like spring-like weather in the winter and it, things that are, things are already, you know, we feel a little bit not recognizing, you know, seeing like magnolia blooms happening in November or weird, weird things that keep happening. Um, 
And so the landscapes are purposely a little bit disorienting. And the things that are in the landscape, I picture in a way as the relics left behind of by people, people making these things as part of rituals or as signposts for other people along the path, along the trail. Like something like this could be a sign marker at a water source, just indicating east and west. And the feathers there are of the western race of the northern flicker on the left, the eastern race on the right. So in a way, it could be some sort of continental divide kind of marker where, you know, someone would someone would have left this for someone else, like a cairn along a trail um, or performed as something. And in a lot of these, there's a lot of little clues like, you know, is that a zebra as an introduced species um, or is it way into the past when there were horse species here? And we don't know if maybe some of them were striped and like people have dealt with climate upheaval before and we are going to again and where are we finding our way? Um, a little Eastern marker, a Western marker. And these could be made as, as markers for people along the way, or as who knows, some sort of ritual wish, like we're heading to the West. How are we going to get there? Um, along a well-traveled pathway, would everyone make something and leave it as a devotional object? And when I made this piece, I was thinking about the Darien gap where, when people are moving from South America and walking through Central America and have to go through this very treacherous place in the jungle. How are they making their way through that? Are they, are they, they are helping each other. Would they, would some sort of mythology develop, like be like the bird, you know, become bird fly, you know, as the crow flies, let me get across this thing, you know, these hopeful objects and other things that we might make, um, maybe larger rituals that, you know, mark an exodus from somewhere or are part of a larger ceremony or part of something as a mark for maybe we came from somewhere and now this is something that we do to mark that time of when we had to leave or travel somewhere. Uh, this was ritual for leaving California. Let's see, this was ritual for finding your way in the dark. This is ritual for safe passage. And just thinking about, you know, if you had to pass through a desert in a pretty dangerous area and you had to travel that way with your children, you would be praying to whatever God you have or invented and maybe doing a devotional, something devotional about that. Um, this is kind of a self-portrait. I'm a parent and just putting myself in the shoes of these people who are making these trips with with kids and how scary that would be and how you'd be hopeful, but fearful and looking for help and guidance anywhere. Um, a devotional object made is a, a hope for crossing a border. Another one about border crossing. Um, in these, in these objects I've made, you know, I also felt like a freedom to be like more expressive in them than I would be if I was representing like people, you know, actual people. It's, there's something where you can almost, at least for me, I can get a little bit closer to the emotion of the person by making the thing that I think they would have made rather than showing them like trying to get across a border. There's something, you know, for me that is more evocative in the thing that's left behind that they made and potentially more, more tender. Um, I want to imagine a hopeful future, uh, where even though it's it's hard and, and we've lost a lot, we're able to help each other move forward. Um, so a lot of these a lot of these paintings to me are like hopeful, these little relics, because there is moments of, of of care. And you know, like animals don't care what happens to us. The planet does not care what happens to us. Um, the earth doesn't care. But I care and 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 we care. And you know, there is this idea of tending to one another and helping. Like I, I am making these as a way to be hopeful for the future, to move through in a hopeful way rather than a it's all destruction type of a way. Because um, that's in a way the only, I wish there was a better word than hope. I wish there was a word that wasn't hope. That was more, um, that hope I think sometimes suggests naivete and it's, it, I want, it, I don't think any of us are naive about it, but I do want something like hope moving forward. So yeah, that's, that's sort of where we are with that. 
Anyway, that's the talk. That was it. Thank you so much, George, for this wonderful presentation. First of all, your art is just absolutely stunning. Um, and you're really the perfect person to have in this series because of the through line that is so powerful in your art of raising consciousness about our relationship to the earth and um, mm -hmm. those that inhabit it and the eye contact that you can't help but make with some of the animals in your works um, just almost forces a connection. Uh, mm -hmm. with the viewer uh, that triggers an empathy that's just really, really powerful. Um, so thank you so much for taking us through uh, all of your your processes and how you do things and what you're thinking when you're coming up with all of this. Uh, that was really a treat. Thanks. Um, and I love how your work looks forward because so much is changing right now. We can't really look back to find out how to deal with this crisis. Um, yeah, we not, have to look forward. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess there are some things we could learn from looking back, of yeah. course. But it, it sort of it has to be imaginative at this point, um, and you're really taking that on. Um, it is. It is this thing I thought about because it's it, you know I'll have this discussion with students too. What is the role of the artist in? what is the role of the artist? You know, does the, does the artist have to have a role? Does the, does the artist have responsibility to have a role? And I don't think they do, but I think they can. And mm -hmm. I think that there's this idea of, can the artist be, with your art, can you try to imagine? Can you try to present? Can you try to, like, it's almost like speculative fiction, you know, it's like, kind of, I mean, these do look a bit sci-fi, you know, <laughs> like that's not mm -hmm. lost on me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is something about that, like speculative fiction, but it's the imagery is already there. Like when I was like showing those Australian wildfire photos, it's like, we have a lot of imagery of climate change right now. We have a lot of imagery of destruction. So like, what's next? Like, can we think about like where we're going, not where we, not where we are or where we've been, you know, it, it's that idea of trying to like jump ahead. Yeah. Do you have a timeline in your head about your depictions of this possible future? Do, like, does that, when do those pieces take place to you? I don't know. Like some of them I feel like could be right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like some of those like little smaller scale, like, like maybe someone made a little thing. Like I wouldn't be surprised if you scanned all the border between the U S and Mexico, if you didn't find some sort of little prayer type objects or something like, I feel like that could be something that's already happening now. Other stuff where it's maybe more suggestive of like a more developed ritual. I feel like maybe that's hundreds or thousands of years in the, in the, in the distance. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of questions in the audience from Patrick. There seems to be a peaceful acceptance of the inevitability of the impacts of climate change in your work. For example, the idea of moving into a disoriented landscape. What role do you see hope playing in how we move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's what a, a lot of the reasoning behind while I'm doing it. And I think also I've been in this like <laughs> I've been in the climate grief space for a very long time. I think because, you know, I um even having initially like pursued a degree in marine biology, it was already, you're almost already becoming a, I don't want to say a chronicler of, of loss, but you certainly are now if you're in that field. And there's this idea of, um, if you don't have hope, what do you have? I mean, like the most like climate responsible thing to do, I guess would be kill yourself. Like, I mean, you know, it's sort of, it's like you're, you're taking up resources, whatever, but like, that's not an option for me. And, and, and I want to like move forward. And also like, I'm a parent and I think about like, okay, what is coming? And I think also it's like the stages of grief. Like, I think there is, there is more writing lately about climate grief and, and climate anxiety. And I think that I was living in that space for so long. And I think I did actually process a lot of that. So when, Patrick said the word acceptance, that is something I think about a lot because I'm like, okay, we are going to lose this and lose that. And, and there is this idea of being, I don't want to say okay with it. Like it's still sad, 
but you eventually become okay with it. Like when you lose someone you love, you eventually you accept it, even though it's still always sad. And this idea of hope, that's I think why I was saying at the end, like I wish we had a better word than hope because I hate how it connotates naive, but there is something to me, even though these images can don't look hopeful to everybody for me, the practice of making them and make and, and their existence makes me hopeful because they, you know, they mean that people are around making them and have an active culture and things are happening. And if there are parts of birds in them, that means those birds are still existing. And there's, it, it's sort of, there's something hopeful in them to me, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The role of hope is, the role of hope is good when it's paired with action, I think. Yeah. Well, the, the, your paintings are of a future a vastly different future, but one that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so we have something from Richard that says, fascinating, My par it, many parallels to work I am doing on palliative care for a mm -hmm. dying culture and seeking subversive methods to reconnect and connect with right brain engagement in a world that only validates left brain conceptions. Mm -hmm. developing personal relationships to place and archetypes, gods, goddesses, and enabling them to re-enter our individual and collective relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's true. It kind of relates to what I was talking about before, like processing grief and like, you know, palliative care in a way it's like, I, you know, I think a lot of us in, who are either making work about climate change or dealing with it on some level, I have a lot of friends who are scientists and one of my friends is a, is a coral scientist and that's rough. <laughs> I mean, you are basically anyone who's working in, they are, they are doing palliative care for coral reefs right now. So it's, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting parallel there. And I think it's an apt connection to make. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's really, it's very, very hard to move through this. And I think a lot of people don't want to, and especially when you say even like the right brain, life, left brain thing, like being in the art world too, it's like, I've only seen in the last few years, the furthered industrialization in the art world and speeding up of capitalism in the art world, even though when it, it seems like it's addressing certain issues, what I actually see is not that I, I, I think it's. I think there is still fear to make stuff that isn't going to be market safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I've definitely had people tell me like, no one's going to buy this work because it's too much of a bummer. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. ooh, collectors don't want to think about their carbon footprint. I'm like, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do with this series is to get people <laughs> into, um, you know, different ways of thinking about things. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have something from Brandon. Uh, when you mentioned Carolina parakeets, my thoughts went to the monk parakeets who have established communities in the Eastern US. The loss of Carolina parakeets is widely lamented, but few people celebrate monk parakeets. They're mostly ignored or considered unwelcome and non-native. Have you thought much about them? And I have. And value? it's of yeah. historical nativity in this world i have i think about that a lot it's actually funny because i do i do a lecture for my students in one of my classes and i follow the photos that i show the of the carolina parakeet with photos of monk parakeets and i'm like <laughs> okay but now we have these in some of the exact same places and and sort of talk about that idea because i think that's a really interesting conversation too the idea of of you know, when we categorize things as native species, invasive species, introduced species, we have all these different categorizations based upon, I guess, level of harm. That's sort of the, you know, the idea behind a lot of that. Um, and it's interesting because I think about that a lot. I also think about that in relationship to where like our culture is rooted in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the again, I think I mentioned this earlier, like the dominant culture in the U.S. is one that isn't rooted 
in the land of the U.S. And like our folklore didn't come out of the animals here. And, you know, growing up, you still have like when you're a kid, when I was growing up, a lot of the children's books you have are still rooted in a really European um, root. So it would be like animals that were there, not here. And and sort of, and I remember living in Florida too. I was like, why is everyone pretending it's Christmas? Like it's winter, like with the decorations and whatever. And I'm like, where's, where's stuff rooted here? Like there's, it, it, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thought. And I think about that a lot, about the idea of native and non-native. Like, you know, it, it's like humans are only native to, you know, Eastern Africa initially. <laughs> like, and then we went everywhere. Like, I mean- it's a, it's an interesting thought. I think now it's like, you know, people are just worried about it because of the speed and how much disruption it causes. And, you know, basically European starlings kicking bluebirds out of their nesting habitat, you know, and stuff like that. But I do think it's really interesting to think about. And I love the the monk parakeet, Carolina parakeet thing, because that's exactly, I, I talk about exactly that in this class. It's really funny. Like I have the slide, follow the other one. Funny. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it was interesting what you were saying about you know the that the Americans aren't necessarily connected to their their land, and how you have to go to the animals who are deeply connected. And but we are animals, and this is something that I don't think a lot, uh, most of us really think of ourselves as animals. And um, it's just a different way of connecting, like that, and taking away the disconnect mm -hmm. is to really say you know, we are part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have Ronald with a quote from T.S. Eliot, hope is always hope for the wrong thing, which I think <laughs> is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, from Marie, do you see a connection between the effects of climate change and the kind of destruction to the world that we see happening with the bombardment of weapons? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's it's funny making especially making all these pieces that where I was thinking about um border crossing and you know and then we're talking about a lot of border crossing right now but because of warfare and, and sort of climate change but it's but it is again this fight over land and resources and and again just these like violent violent impulses and 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 I do think there's a real connection to that because when you're disconnected from the land you can treat it more thoughtlessly mm -hmm. and so that idea of like being connected to like creatures that are non-human and that will give you more empathy and understanding and connection and mm -hmm. you know we're disconnected from that and then we treat the earth violently and don't make those connections because we've severed so many of those connections so we don't realize like oh hey this thing that you're doing is actually quite like harmful to yourself ultimately but you know to the planet here or there or whatever and because we're so disconnected from like how we actually survive like where our food comes from where everything comes from where everything that we use is made and those materials are coming who got those materials for you and all of it so it is this like level of disconnection whether it's like a disconnection from nature so that then we treat it horribly a disconnection from other people so that then we treat them horribly but that idea of like violence and the perpetration of violence yeah, I mean, I think there is there is a real connection there. Mm -hmm. We have one final question um, from Shay, who is wondering, um, are you currently still working with ink on paper? And if not, what drove the shift from working with ink on paper? And what are your thoughts for artists and the footprint that we in the art world leave in our wake of creation and presentation? Excellent questions. Um, I will say this. So for for the switch, the switch happened mostly because um, a, a couple of reasons. One was a practical switch. I was making these really large scale, um, you know, ink on paper drawings that if one mistake was made, that was it. It, it was screwed. Like <laughs> that was, you had to then start over. And I was doing these technically really difficult things. And all the white you would see in those was the white of the paper. And so I had made a massive mistake on a piece and I was like, never again. I am never doing another ink on paper. It was just like too disruptive and too crazy. And I was like, this is like too much. Like I can't, this is like, I got to switch. But then it was also, um, I wanted to make pieces that were more of like world creating where I had like 
in a way I was taking away so much stuff and editing those images down before. And here I was putting more in and I knew I wanted like, in a way, backgrounds, you know, because I wanted to suggest certain things and I want to suggest the sky as like almost a stand in for climate. And it, there, there, there's something going there. And just technically in order to do that on ink on paper, it would be a pain in the butt. It wouldn't really work. I wouldn't really be able to get a lot of the effects that I'd want. So it was, it was a technical consideration initially. And then I also wanted them to feel a little bit more solid somehow. And I think also when I started making all these paintings based upon the sculptures I would make, there was something about like the paint and the clay that there was a better analog or a better, a better connection between the two. So that was, that sort of drove the, drove the, um, switch. And it is interesting to think, think about the materials. Uh, I'm part of a group called Artists Commit, which is a group of artists, which is moving, trying to move the art world towards a more climate conscious <laughs> behavior and recognizing how that intersects with social justice and everything else. And so we talk a lot about this, about material usage, um, thinking about your work that you create from cradle to grave, what materials you're using? Are there alternative materials? Where does this go? Where, you know, what, what are you making? What is the actual physical impact of the thing that you're, that you're making? Um, I think about it a lot too in the sales, like, you know, as an artist, you become very dependent upon the top 0.05% who's, you know, buying your stuff, who are the biggest emitters. And, you know, so it's an interesting, an interesting thing to think about, but this group is great. We've, we've helped assist artists do, what we've been calling climate impact reports where they are kind of doing an assessment of what the climate impact report was for a given exhibition, a given project and all of that. And so we're trying to move even more forward through the art world and sort of instilling best practices, whether it's, you know, alternative energy sources, shipping differently, having galleries change their time scale, which will allow for better and more ethical shipping methods, like just so much stuff that we can change. And so that is something specifically I think about. I even think about it with this because I went to, you know, oil paints from using inks on paper. So oil paint uses a lot of chemicals and you could think about that as like, okay, that's, that's pretty bad. Now you're using stuff that has more chemicals, but I've switched the materials that I use. So I don't use um, the same solvents anymore. I use like lavender spike oil stuff and, and just different oils. And what's really can be dangerous in paints are the pigments the heavy metals that are in your pigments, all that stuff. And I use them very sparingly because of the way I paint. I'll paint the image in grayscale, which is basically just charcoal and linseed oil and titanium and zinc and linseed oil, and then glaze the color on top. So I'm using as little as possible of any of these like potentially more damaging chemical pigments. Uh, but it is something that I think about a lot. Like, okay, what does the world need more paintings? No, not really. Um, but it is something that like, you know, it's the acknowledgement of what does go in the garbage too. Like, what do you do in your practice that can't be mitigated? You know, and, and reckoning with that. Like, you know, you you manage what you measure, which was a quote from, I think, Jordan Seabury, who did a climate impact report with Artists Commit. And I just think that's such a great quote. Like, just again, reconnecting. Where, you know, where does your stuff come from? Where does it go? what is its cradle to grave um existence and thinking and knowing that and, and reckoning and acknowledging it yeah. mm -hmm. yep excellent thank you so much george it's been a pleasure to talk with you today thanks it's been a pleasure to talk to you too and thank you all for being here and taking part in this event and if you have further questions, please feel free to uh, post them on our forum on eras.org. You can leave comments, questions, reflections on the event there. And if any images came to mind during today's event, please send them to info at eras.org and we will add them to our Gaia gallery. Thank you again for coming today and we wish you all a happy holiday season.